Well, for more on China's new investment rules, I'm joined by Brian Peck, live from Los Angeles. Brian is the director of the Center for Transnational Law and Business at the USC Gold School of Law. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. So what do you see as the most important changes with this new law? I think a couple of changes are very important here. One is it provides national treatment, as they termed it, or equal treatment, whereas foreign investors will receive the same uh, favorable treatment that domestic investors have. The other is the protection from expropriation in terms of if uh, any sort of asset of an investor, a foreign investor, were to be expropriated by the government for whatever reason, by regulation or actual taking, there would be fair, um, effective, and adequate compensation for that. That's similar to the U.S. standard for expropriation cases. I think the third very important thing, at least for the U.S., is if, if a deed is passed in the final version, would be the prohibition of forced technology transfer in for currently uh, foreign joint equity ventures or joint um, foreign uh, non-equity ventures, which now is the source of a uh, key concern for U.S. trade negotiators. And we know that this law would combine and replace three ex pre-existing laws covering Chinese foreign equity joint ventures, non-equity joint ventures, as well as wholly mm -hmm. foreign-owned enterprises. What are the biggest benefits of unifying these laws? Well, again, it provides certainty. Uh, right now, for example, take the forced technology transfer issue, um, which you could, is, a, is a key issue for the United States. Wholly owned uh, foreign enterprises are not required, obviously, because they are wholly owned, foreign owned enterprises are not required for the forced technology transfer. However, if a foreign investor wants to enter into a joint venture with a Chinese domestic partner, then that forced uh, tra technology transfer comes into play. So having that uniformity of the three um, brings cer greater certainty and um, equal treatment for any type of foreign uh, uh, venture that is uh, by a foreign investor. Now, with this new draft law coming up as trade negotiations are ongoing in the U.S., between the U.S. and China, how do you see that impacting the talks? I think it has a positive impact because again, it addresses some of the key concerns that U.S. trade negotiators have and that the Trump administration has. For example, again, the forced technology transfer, but also market access. Um, it's a long-held view of U.S. negotiators and the U.S. government that you know, there are certain barriers, non-tariff barriers, that prohibit or prevent or make it very difficult for U.S. investors and U.S. businesses to operate in China. So by leveling the playing field for investors, by opening up the investment and including new sectors that are now open, such as financial services, um, transportation, and energy, for example, it allows greater opportunities um, in terms of market access and addresses some of the IPR and technology transfer concerns. So it would have a positive effect, I believe. Now, another major concern that foreign companies have is enforcement of these laws. So what needs to be in place to ensure that the policies are enforced at the local level? Well, and that's the key point. I think the sticking point is that there have been promises in the past that have not been carried through or have been implemented in, in law but not in practice. And it gets more difficult in enforcement as it gets to the local level. So I think what the U.S. would want to see is, although I think, as I said, it would be a positive development in terms of the trade negotiations uh, that are currently taking place here, there in Washington, is that the, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. And that is that they need to see the implementing regulations, as the previous report noted, and they need to see actual enforcement um, and in, in, at both the national level and at the local level. That'll be key. And I think... Uh, you know, the U.S. side, in, as part of the negotiations they're seeking with the Chinese side in these talks, is to ensure that there is strict uh, monitoring and enforcement mechanisms to ensure that these promises are carried out. And as we look at the broader investment landscape, how would you say the current trade standoff between the U.S. and China is affecting that? I think it has a significant impact. Um, and if, if indeed, if the talks do not, are not successful in at least extending the truce beyond the current March 1st deadline, if indeed they can't reach an agreement before then, I think you're going to see even more um, negative impact in terms of investment decisions and, you know, looking at maybe longer term solutions of sourcing of manufacturing and other sources outside of China, given, you know, the, the uncertainty of the tariffs and, you know, the economic impact that it has on both countries. And what about China welcoming more foreign investment and having better protections for foreign firms affecting China's economic slowdown? I think in terms of, you know, of, of the current lack of protection also is a factor in terms of business decisions um, and what types of investment are pouring in China or coming into China versus that was being withheld. There is a recent study showing, for example, that it's not just particularly China, but there is a global trend, uh, given the current uncertainty between the U.S. and China trade war, of you know, reducing um, ec uh, investment decisions in China and in other, in other parts of the region.
All right, thank you very much. Brian Peck there, Director of the Center for Transnational Law and Business at the USC Gold School of Law.